Thank you very much. Can I welcome everyone to the second meeting of the Justice Subcommittee on Policing in 2015? Can I ask everyone to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices completely as they interfere with the broadcasting, even when they're switched to silent? Apologies have been received from Margaret Mitchell. Okay, I'll take I'll come to you in a minute. I'm just going to do a declaration of interest first. I welcome Elaine Murray to the subcommittee and our new member energetic and volunteering, if I recall. <laughs> On our first first item of business today is to invite Lane to declare any interest relevant to the remit of the subcommittee. Nothing relevant to the remit of the sub subcommittee. And before I move on, you have something briefly you want to say, Alison. I do, convener. Thank you very much. Um, in June, um, last June, a senior police officer told this committee that non-statutory stop and search of under 12s would stop forthwith. It has been revealed this week that contrary to that assurance to this parliamentary committee, it continued unabated and by November it was at a higher level than in June when that officer said it was indefensible. That lack of regard for the authority of this parliament is, I should say, surprising. Can I ask for an urgent meeting of this committee to recall the ACC to account for this contradiction? Yes, and as you know, Alison, it, well, this all came too late in the day and we had already a panel of witnesses uh, uh, who had given up their time in their diaries and uh, obviously to come here today, so it was too late in the day okay. for today's meeting. But I do appreciate it's something. Can I take it the committee would be agreeable to our next meeting, which would be the first meeting after recess, to dealing with this matter? Yes. All agreed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, item two... Uh, subcommittee has agreed to consider item four in our work programme in private. Are we agreed? agreed. Thank you. Now to item three, handling of police complaints. Uh, this is the main item on the agenda today, and I welcome meeting Superintendent John McKenzie, Professional Standards Police Scotland, Ian Ross, Chair of the Complaints and Conduct Committee, SPA, Lindsay McNeil, Director of Governance and Assurance at the SPA, Chief Superintendent, is it Niven? Niven Rennie, President of the Association of um, Scottish Police Superintendents, and Callum Steele, General Secretary of the uh, Scottish Police Federation. Now, as you know, I don't need to really say this, but I will. We can't go into individual cases, but we can talk about the generality here. Um, and uh, you've also had, as you know, a letter from Linda Fabiani, I think, on an issue for which I was also personally aware. Uh, but again, in the broader context to discuss it. Can I go straight to questions from members? Yes, Kevin. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, convener. And uh, we have seen from uh, the information that we have received that there has been an increase in the number of complaints received by Police Scotland. Uh, and uh, I wonder if the transition to a single service has uh, led to that increase. Uh, and beyond that, convener, I wonder if some of the complaints that have come in have been historic complaints from the previous uh, forces. Right, so if you just self-nominate, if you indicate to me if you want to be called. Uh, yes, um, I must get the titles right. Superintendent Mackenzie. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, if I may take the first part of the question um, initially, the increase in rise um, and these are the figures from the annual statistical return that's been produced by the, the park indicate a 7% increase. Um, I think it's too simplistic to actually say that this is simply because of the movement to Police Scotland. And I think we have to consider two significant factors of why there has been an increase by 7%. The first factor is the definition of a complaint changed um, in um, April 2013, there has always been a definition in the 2006 Act of a relevant complaint, and that was a written um, expression of dissatisfaction. That's increased to that of oral, electronic and written, so it became easier for members of the public to make complaints, and that's a good thing. And the second point is, um, if I may highlight, uh, the Park Statutory Guidance used to talk about complaints called frontline resolutions. And prior to April 2013, uh, many forces did not record frontline resolutions on their annual statistical return. These are complaints where members of the public may come in and a sergeant at the desk would give them an explanation there and then and the member of the public would say thank you very much and move on. Sometimes these would be rec not recorded on Centurion on the database that the return is provided. So these, these two elements changed in April 2013 and uh, as a result these have contributed to the increase of that 7%. Um, and no, sorry, just please continue. Yes. Yes. Uh, in terms of the second element of the question, has there been any uh, historical complaints? Um, there have been some complaints that have came, obviously, from the historical or the legacy forces 
as we entered into 2013, as you would expect, but nothing significant and no great change in terms of what would have been expected from that crossover period, just from the March into April. Uh, I don't have the specific figures for you, but um, that is my uh, understanding. Before you take in, Mr Ross, convener, can I ask... Um, I Super was going to let you go on, yes. Can I ask Superintendent uh, Mackenzie, uh, having served on uh, a police board for a very long time, um, you know, I was aware of a number of folks who were vexatious uh, complainers, and I just wonder if uh, Police Scotland have inherited... Uh, some of, of that from the force and whether um, some of the folks who may have stopped complaining uh, have, have returned because of the uh, birth of Police Scotland and the demise of the, of the previous eight forces. It's a good point, certainly. There have been examples of vexatious complainers that have continued to complain uh, as we move into the single force. Um, also, what has been the experience of Police Scotland is Complaints that have been dealt with by legacy forces, by vexatious complainers, have been um, brought back into Police Scotland in a different form to make a further attempt for investigation. But again, through assessment, uh, that's been managed through assessment. So we do have vexatious complainers, um, and um, they have, you know, a number have came from uh, the legacy forces, certainly. Uh, and would they account for a significant? Uh, amount of the increase or is that basically the change in the legislation which it makes it easier to complain? The increase is down to the change in the, the definition and uh, more significantly the change in recording practice around the frontline resolution complaints that exist. Before you move on, who assesses, um, you said you know they're assessed? Yes. Who assesses? Well at this moment in time under Police Scotland from September of um, 2014 there are three central assessment hubs within Scotland, one based in Glasgow, one in Edinburgh and one in Aberdeen. And these are resourced by uh, sergeants and inspectors. Uh, complaints will come in. Um, a member of the public uh, will uh, you know, contact Police Scotland through various means. That unit will assess that complaint to determine what category of complaint it is. And will also make initial telephone contact with that uh, complainer so that there is that... Um, quick turnaround in terms of they have a point of contact so they know the complaint has been dealt with seriously. Um, and 39% of complaints that are uh, that come into Police Scotland are actually dealt with through that process of initial telephone communication, understanding the problem that exists and being able to give an explanation or come back with an explanation over the phone. But the assessment unit will make that decision and thereafter it will be determined who is the most appropriate department to investigate that, whether it's a local division, PSD, a specialist crime department, or in significant and serious circumstances uh, of criminal allegations. There may be occasions when we go direct to Crown and there's a referral to the park. So there are a number of routes in which complaints can be dealt with. And does a different, if it happens in one division, does a different division do the assessment? It's not done within the same, what I'm getting at is by a disinterested group in that sense, clearly seen to be that. Yes. Um, the divisions within Police Scotland, professional standards assess all complaints. So the complaints are dealt with by professional standards, assessed by professional standards. Previously, complaints prior to September of last year, complaints could be assessed by the Home Division. That no longer happens from okay. September. They're assessed um, by professional standards and so there is that transparency at that point, yes. I'll let, can I let Mr Ross uh, please, yeah. Mr Ross. Thank you, Chair. Just really on that subject, I mean, as part of our wider role, it's to scrutinise the way that professional standards within Police Scotland um, uh, handle complaints. And the very point you've raised is one that has been discussed on a number of occasions within the Complaints Committee. And I can confirm that in terms of the explanation, um, it very much was linked to particularly one or two legacy forces that um, did not record the, 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 that particular approach. I think the other factor that comes into play is also that there's um, a promotion of the openness to make a complaint. And that's difficult to measure, but there's, I think in terms of signposting and awareness uh, that if people have a complaint, they should actually raise it. In terms of SPA, in terms of our stats, I think it's very similar to the position that existed um, prior to the, the creation of Police Scotland and the SPA, but we did inherit a number of legacy complaints. 
most of which have now been addressed, but uh, by their nature they tended to be fairly complex, so that was one of the reasons that they continued into the new format. And on the unacceptable actions, I can confirm that we also have such a policy. We have used it on a very limited number of occasions, but I think the key point is that doesn't mean that if someone complains and it's a valid complaint, that it is not then taken through the full procedure. And I think that's a, a critical point to make, and I'm, I'm sure the same applies with Police Scotland. Can I, I can, just a wee minute, can I let others in first? I know, because I think I've got a little list, and then I'll come back to you, because it's all on the same thing, really. John, followed by Elaine, and then I'll come back to you, Kevin. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Good afternoon, panel. It, it's, it's a question, first and foremost, to uh, Mr Steele, and then Mr Niven, perhaps. Um, <laughs> and it relates to previous changes to the, the, the discipline small deer regime, um, and a significant one in 1996, which sought to remove quasi-judicial terms, as I understand, and bring about a more managerial style of dealing with these things. That was a, a cultural change that didn't quite materialise. Is, is, there, is that still the aim, as you understand, Mr Steele, to have a more managerial rather than, shall we say, a militaristic approach to it? Uh, more than that, uh, Mr Finney. In fact, the, the new conduct regulations, which uh, were hoped to have been brought in at the birth of the creation of the new single service, uh, have come into being now, uh, and the they are certainly designed around an intention to have earlier resolution and be more managerial based. Uh, one of the great uh, leaps of faith, if you like, for uh, police officers as a consequence of that change is that they're dealing with uh, a set of regulations which are more managerially based, but their experiences have tended to be more adversarially based. So there is a, uh, there is a coming together of, uh, of uh, cultures there, if, if you like. Uh, but I think it's probably important to say that whilst uh, I in particular and uh, my, my colleagues across Scotland were very heavily critical of the old approach to uh, police misconduct, certainly in respect of how it deals with uh, our members at the early stages, uh, the relationship that exists within the Police Service of Scotland at this moment in time is one uh, which certainly instills confidence. And of course, only practice will uh, uh, show whether that confidence is, is well deserved. Thank you. And, uh, I wonder, Mr Rennie, given your member... Yes, he's just wanted to call my Chief Superintendent. Yeah, yes. but I would like to ask uh, an additional question, if I may, um, Superintendent, and, th and that was given the, the role that your members had uh, in adjudicating on um, matters, uh, how has their relationship with the Federated Ranks altered at all, if at all? I don't think their uh, relationship with the Federated Ranks has altered in any great uh, way. I, I agree with Callum. The whole desire now is to deal with things at the lowest possible level and each le get learning from situations as opposed to punishment. That, that's a desire of the regulations. Unfortunately, what we're starting to see, particularly at our level, is a greater desire uh, to investigate, uh, more people being brought under the spotlight, uh, and the time taken for these investigations to progress uh, is unfortunately far too long. And the result of that is that with a smaller number of superintendents and chief superintendents in the country under a great working pressure, uh, this is adding to the burden that they're carrying and, and we're seeing examples of people's health suffering. Uh, and, and so the desire to deal with things at the lowest possible level and get them dealt with quickly doesn't seem to be materialising, particularly in respect to my members. I can see that that would add to an already heavy workload. Was there any workload assessment done of the implications of the change in regulations for the superintending ranks? Then? It, it's, it was done. It certainly predates my time uh, as a member of the executive. And may need revisited then, perhaps. Indeed. I wonder if I could ask the panel, uh, and it's for all the members, the, the question of what might be referred to as a service complaint. So rather than an individual, it's about the, the police particularly. And, and maybe, Mr Ross, some people might want to blame the chief constable when it's the police service that the real issue is with and, and how that particular aspect of moving it from the, the individual to, to seeing it as the organisational matter to be addressed. How's that dealt with if someone gets in touch with you and says, I want to complain about Sir Stephen House? Well, um, it, it, certainly I think it's fair to say that that does happen, that I think that the figurehead is often identified as the person that they would complain about. Um, but what we tend to do as part of our procedures, uh, there is an assessment carried out, an early assessment, and what is not, not uncommon in terms of the contacts, the contacts we get at that stage, that in fact it's more appropriate that is then referred to Police Scotland to be dealt with, because the... 
the, let's say the focus of the complaint is not in fact uh, a chief officer, it would be somebody else or it could be uh, some aspects of policy. And what we certainly have tried to do, and we put particular emphasis in the last six months, is that that initial point of contact, whether it's through the website or through other forms of information, sort of highlight that and make people more alert to it. And I think one of the, uh, the recent evidence suggests that in fact we've probably had fewer contacts as a consequence of that where people have identified that perhaps the, 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 the actual organisation that would deal with it would not necessarily be the SPA. But our approach, I think, as I said to the earlier question, is that if people have an issue, we want them to raise that issue, and then we can take it through the due and appropriate process. Thank, thank you. And, and how, if there's an outcome, so if, if there's issues to be learned, how is that fed into the wider policing arrangements? Well, um, the, the, or maybe it's too early for that for your own... Well, I mean, I think the general comment I would make is that, you know, the focus is on early resolution and it's about, uh, about learning points. So irrespective of the nature of the approach, I think we're always very keen to make sure that those are identified and those are applied. And that's also part of some of the discussions that we have with Police, with Police Scotland on a regular basis. I'll come back to you, yeah, if okay. you like. I'll, I'll have... Sorry, I yes. beg your pardon. May I just make of an course. additional comment to that? Um, <clears throat> The service type complaints, those quality of service complaints that are not addressed at individuals but addressed at the organisation, they can be split into a number of categories. But from a learning opportunities perspective, within PSD we do have a portfolio and a lead in terms of learning and prevention. Our aim is to prevent as many complaints, learn from the complaints that we can and enhance the service that we can to the public. And work is ongoing to understand any issues that people have with policy and procedure, the quality of service type complaints that exist. Yeah, sorry for a simple time. I mean, that's an excellent explanation, but I got a bit lost understanding it. Mm -hmm. Can you give examples of what you mean? So and that it, by service and then learning from it and so on. You know, okay. give some ordinary examples that punters like me understand. Okay, the um, members of the public. Um, a number of complaints uh, come in about vehicle recovery schemes in terms of. Um, people's cars being uplifted from the side right. of the road and there is a lack of explanation or understanding of the legislative guidelines in relation to the removal of vehicles. Uh, people make complaints because um, one, there's a failure to understand and two, there's sometimes a financial penalty to get their car back um, and as such um, we have ensured or we've went back to try and provide a better explanation on the website in terms of what VRS is and try to at least provide additional information to individuals about what the expectations are in terms of the recovery of their cars. So that's one example um, whereby we hope to sort of reduce complaints by providing additional in information to members of the public. Right, that was helpful. That was helpful. Um, now, can I move? Yes, um, I've got Elaine. And, Hi. Yes. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, my question really arises from my personal experience, I suppose, of, of having constituents come to me who have complaints against the police. Uh, previously, in those sort of circumstances, I would write to the Chief Constable. Now, you would usually get a fairly detailed response from the Chief Constable or a senior officer, and fairly timidly afterwards addressing the points that had been raised by a constituent. Now, that went on after Police Scotland was formed. That was happening. Recently, however, my experience has been that uh, you get nothing back until you get a copy of a letter uh, which has gone out to the constituent saying... I understand you had a complaint about the police and I understand that it has been resolved satisfactorily. Now, that actually doesn't... I feel there's a, a lack of democratic accountability there. And I see also that there is evidence that local commanders have stopped pr providing local authorities with information about complaints. I just wonder, has there been a change in terms of the way in which elected representatives can take up uh, complaints against the police uh, on behalf of their constituents? Um, quick consent to... to to address those two points. Um, Excuse me, we're just, we're just doing a little uh, a survey here. I have actually had that as well, mm. where the constituent was told the resolution, and I was just simply told mm. it has now been resolved. So having made the contact, mm. I was expecting yep. at least to be cc'd in mm. to the response to the constituent. Convener, you did not have that. Convener, could I ask maybe uh, if we ask if it may be handled in different ways in different parts of the country? Yes. Because normally my response comes directly from the divisional commander, Chief Superintendent Adrian Watson in Aberdeen's case. Yeah. Okay. You've, you've Likewise, I, I don't have issues about that. Uh, well, there we are. So it's been different experiences. By the way, I wrote to the Chief Constable because it was an issue which only the Chief Constable could remedy. I think there's other ways of dealing with it, so yeah. make that plainer. You know. 
Yes, perhaps you could answer that. Then. Yes, I mean, uh, may I apologise if that is the position yeah. that you are not provided with uh, a copy of the extensive uh, letter or the explanation letter to the individual. As, as the elected member who is raising that concern, it is only appropriate that you have received or at least copied into the, uh, the response so you have a clear understanding of what the engagement has been and what the explanation is to your uh, constituent. So I would be obliged if I could take that back and try and address that. I mean, I, different, it's interesting to hear that different areas have different uh, experiences. Everybody should have the same experience that you should get a copy of that letter. And if that is not the case, I do apologise for that and I will uh, address that uh, at the termination of this uh, committee. In terms of um, the information in relation to local authorities, I am aware that when Police Scotland uh, commenced in 2013, there were a number of issues in terms of the provision of information to local authorities. Actually, I think this comes down to the roles and responsibilities um, that used to exist in the legacy arrangements through police boards and now through the SPA. Um, the SPA are provided with statistical information in relation to uh, complaints and local commanders are also provided with statistical information in relation to complaints. They are all provided with the same type of information so there is a consistency across Scotland and um, at this moment in time, um, I've asked, you know, the, the information that exists it is broken down into local areas. It's on the SPA website also. Um, so there is information given to local commanders about complaints to provide that information to local authorities. Thank you. I've got Alison followed by Kevin, then John. Alison. Thanks. Uh, I wonder if, if Mr Ross or, or any, either of the SPA witnesses could give us a bit more detail about the improvement action plan that you agreed with PERC um, and, and, and just talk us through some of them. Well, I'll, I'll start and pass across to, to, to Lindsay, if I may. Um, yes, I mean, PERC carried out an audit. I think they visited us in, in May of last year and they produced a, a report in, in July. Um, uh, and and there, there were a number of um, improvement areas that were identified within that report. I think it's fair to say that in terms of our own approach, we recognised that there were some mm -hmm. um, areas where we needed to do more work and, uh, and significant steps were already in plan to address that. Um, but it, it, almost in advance of actually the production of the, um, the PERC report, we had the beginnings of our improvement plan and then we added to that in the light of the PERC report. Um, I can now confirm that in terms of that improvement plan, I think, uh, bar I think one item uh, which is really looking at wider governance issues, that we have um, we have completed all of those outstanding points. Uh, PERC actually revisited us in the last couple of weeks, and we're okay. waiting for their follow-up report. Um, clearly, I haven't seen it yet, so I can't comment on it. Um, what I would say, though, is that particularly from about the summer of last year, where we were able then to confirm a permanent structure in terms of our two complaint officers, um, a new complaint manager, and I think critically, um, a governance insurance director, namely Lindsay. Um, we now have a, 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 a permanent and much more mature structure. And that has made an enormous difference in terms of our ability to engage. There, there were areas where, which were unsatisfactory in the early part of last year for a range of reasons, particularly around sort of staff resource and resilience. But I'm very confident of the position that we're now in, and I'm very hopeful that, that the PERC report as a follow-up will actually reflect that. There may be some points of detail that, that Lindsay might wish to add. Okay. Certainly working in conjunction with PERC, one of the key areas that we had to look at was actually publishing our uh, complaint handling procedures in detail. So in consultation with them, that they've now been published on our website and are freely available. Um, there were other issues around what information we made available on the website, accessibility and such things. And again, they've actually all been completed. It was in advance of PERC um, visiting us three weeks ago. Um, I mean, um, PERC also recommended you should review your handling of if you don't mind, convener, um, legacy cases to identify any lessons um, learned and, and act on those. Have you been able to follow that through? Yes, yes, we have. Yeah. I think that um, the, the, I think that's how it was written, and I'm sure, and we did that as well. But I think it was also about the learning experience of the difference between how we would handle them and perhaps how they had also been handled within the legacy uh, forces. Um, the situation is that we um, inherited a number of legacy complaints. I think it was around about 17, was it? Um, uh, we now have five remaining, and in fact, they all relate to the same complainant. And uh, I think it's fair to say that it reflects a, a very complex and involved case. 
Um, so I am, I am satisfied where we now are at. Uh, in general, quite a number of the inherited cases were very complex, and a number we moved on very quickly. But there are, there are five that still remain, but I say it all relates to the one complaint, and hopefully uh, in the near passage of time that will be concluded as well. Just, so the end is in sight, you hope, for those five that um, are left? I, I, with, with the experience of <laughs> a number of years of working complaints, I'm always hesitant to say it's absolutely in sight, but I'm very confident in terms of our engagement and seeking to, to, to reach a conclusion. OK, because it helps no one for these things to be so, so long drawn out. Thank you, convener. Yes, um, Kevin, sorry. Yes, um, I've got a question. Th thank you, convener. I, th I think it would be useful uh, for us to know who serves on uh, Mr Ross's Complaints and Conduct Committee? Yes, uh, very happy to... Well, I, I chair the committee. Uh, we have Moy Ali, one of my colleagues who is on it. Uh, we have uh, Brian Barber. Uh, we have uh, Lin Lindsay Tennant, uh, Lisa Tennant. Of the background of, of these folks, are they from local authorities or, or what, what's their background? Um, well, um, another name I was about to mention is Morag McLaughlin, who was an area procurator fiscal. Uh, Paul Rooney had been a member, and he had also some procurator fiscal experience, and he has, he has moved out, and Lisa Tennant has come in. Lisa has, has some involvement in complaints in another sector, I think within, um, I think within so the solicitor area. Moy Ali was the judicial reviewer, again, brings very relevant experience there. And Brian Barber has experience within the private sector of dealing with, with audit and complaint <laughs> handling. So, uh, and in terms of myself, I was a former member of, uh, of uh, a, a police board and chaired a complaints committee for about five or six years in that setting. So um, all of the members come with, with different but relevant experience. But one thing I, would, I want to emphasise is that there also has been ongoing development and there was induction training and there has been subsequent training. In fact, we actually have a workshop that is taking place today where a number of bodies are there to contribute to the further development of members. And we tend to have those workshops every six months. Plus, we have a, a range of other um, engagements in terms of, of member development. Uh, I never actually served in a complaint subcommittee myself while I was in the police board um, convener. Um, but one of the things which some folks saw as an advantage um, was that officers were able to, to tell folk locally, um, although it was grampy and wide, what complaints had come in and what had been going on. Um, at the tail end of 2013, uh, the subcommittee was told that... Um, local commanders were no longer telling uh, local authorities uh, about complaints against officers. Um, can I ask what the position is now, because Police Scotland said that these reports were coming through. I have to be honest and say that uh, I don't know if it's an advantage or a disadvantage uh, for local review uh, bodies to, to know what is going on or not. Um, uh, because uh, sometimes I, I think, uh, in some cases, uh, you know, uh, what eventually happens is a, uh, others become involved in a, a massive complication in the complaint itself when uh, folks maybe stick their nose where, where it's not required. But can I can I find out what the position is in that regard? Well, well the position is that in terms of local authority scrutiny, com scrutiny committees, they can of course raise issues around complaints, and I think as is been described by John, that that statistics will be made available to them. It, it, the issues that they wish to raise is very much driven by the scrutiny committee themselves. And, and in fact, it, I, I attend a couple of committees. We, all, all board members have a link to local authorities across Scotland, so we have total coverage. And certainly the ones that I've visited, I've made it very clear to them that if that was an issue they wished to raise, then you know, we would make sure that information would be made available to them. And I do know that a number have, in fact, have had reports on complaints. Uh, Edinburgh City being one example, just because I, was, I am aware of that. What has changed, though, is in the past you might have had some dip sampling and detailed examination yep. of historical cases. Now, um, the only um, body that can now do that is the Scottish Police Authority, and that's really because of your, your statutory right to have access to that particular type of information. But in terms of... Um, statistical data in terms of discussion on broader issues, 
then a local scrutiny committee, of course, can raise that. And in my own view is I would encourage them to do so. So having served on a, a board yourself previously, uh, Mr Ross, and now in the position uh, that you're in, do you see um, much difference? Do you think this is an improved system compared to what there was in place previously? Um, are you conducting more of the sampling, the dip sampling that you've talked about than well, was done previously? Um, the reality is the answer is no, um, because one of the things that, in fact, has suffered because of a resource issue is that we were not able to start the dip sampling, particularly at a divisional local authority level, as early as we would wish. What I can, I'm happy to confirm now, is that, in fact, before the end of June, we will have carried out our first divisional visit to look at historical uh, practices, and that will include dip sampling. I don't think that's entirely satisfactory, and my... My original intention was that that probably would have happened about a year ago. Um, it was one of the, the challenges that we had to address. But um, I'm pleased to say that now we've moved forward. I wonder if Superintendent McKenzie has got any view in terms of the local scrutiny bodies and, and their uh, locus in this. Well, you weren't indicating Superintendent McKenzie, but please proceed if you feel. Uh, I, I think Mr Ross has highlighted what the statutory restrictions are in terms of local scrutiny boards and... I don't think um, th there's much more comment to make beyond that, to be, uh, to be fair. Yeah. Okay, thank can you. I, can we want to take John now, please? Do you want to come in? I've got a question. Yeah, you. You're looking D, so I'll jump in while you're <laughs> quietly there, because I'm looking at the Park report, and the thing that stands out for me here is the total number of cases alleging criminality, and therefore having re been referred to the Crown Office and PF service, fell but by almost 40% to 225. This is the 2013-14 report. But this is the bit that concerns me, of which just 6.7% led to proceedings being taken. That's an awful lot of people having been referred to the Crown and Procreator Fiscal Service for whom no proceedings were taken. Now, I want to know why this is and how long these people had to wait. Because if I thought I'd been referred as an officer to the PF for Crown Office Service... I would be very ill, I'd be very worried, I'd have huge concerns. And then at the end of the day, over 93%, there are no proceedings. So can somebody shine a light on this for me? I mean, I think I can make comment, and I'm sure both ASPs and the Federation members will wish to, to make additional comment. <clears throat> I think that the point you make is, is very valid. The, the time scale that's taken to move from an allegation of criminality to an end result. It isn't just the time scale, it's also 93% yes. no proceedings, so there's a whole yeah. lot here that needs looking at. Absolutely. And, the, um, and in terms of the 6.7% the in which proceedings are taken, um, from a Police Scotland professional standards perspective, however, um, we do not have a great deal of discretion in terms of what we report to the Crown if there is an inference of criminality. And that is the difference from a member of the public. There has to be corroborative evidence for us to report to the fiscal. However, for a police officer, if there is an inference of criminality, professional standards will report that matter to the Crown. Crown are the independent, transparent body that will we allow... Know, we know yeah, all that stuff, right? And, it yep. and we have a 28-day period to um, report to Cap D in relation to uh, criminal uh, allegations. Um, and then the time scale, um, unfortunately, is out with professional standards hands. And in terms of the um, the, the, um, the the percentage that's moved to proceedings, um, you know, again, that's for Crown to make comment on. Um, what I would say is it's clear we have a category uh, a categorisation uh, process whereby we, from professional standards, will categorise criminal complaints to say, well, actually, do we believe? There is a sufficiency of evidence to pursue, uh, for this case. Um, but again, the final decision sits with Crown. Yeah. And I appreciate there's a higher test for police yes. officers. I, I hear that there, and I see you're nodding there, Mr Steele. But if that's the case, surely there is an obligation, and perhaps not with you, but maybe we need to get to the Crown Office about this, to expedite these matters given the higher test for serving officers, as there should be, I mm -hmm. think we would agree. Is there any other comments from me in this? Yeah, if Thank if you. I, if I could come in there. I think there's an importance uh, around proportionality uh, and also that our procedures should be 
scrutinised and should be transparent and we should deal with things properly, particularly where there's an allegation of, of, of criminality. Uh, I think your comments are quite right. I think we, we wait far too long in many occasions for the result to come back when it, it appears obvious at the outset that whilst we're going to the Crown for confirmation, we feel that there's no real criminality in it in the first place and yet it takes a while to come back. We then start on a misconduct investigation eh, very often thereafter. And we are experiencing occasions where during that misconduct investigation, we are then finding new allegations of criminality, which are then referred back to the Crown and everything ceases whilst it goes back and we wait again. And without going into specific cases, we have a member who's been suspended for over two years and that has been his experience throughout that time. So it is definitely hanging on to a long, a long, making the, the case far more lengthy than requires to be. So how... There must be solutions to this. It can't. How does one ensure there's justice for the individual while there's also a thorough investigation? What needs changed? I think I think procedures, perhaps at the Crown Office, uh, require to be addressed to speed up the process and get early decisions in some of these cases. Does anybody else wish to comment on this? I, I don't agree with uh, with Nevin Rennie in any way, shape, or form. In, in, in terms of the Crown Office, the, the issue of proportionality, of course, is. Uh, uh, is, is key in all of this. Uh, one of the, um, one of the, I'm sure you'd understand, would be a, an, an understandable concern that exists within the, uh, within the members of of my organisation is that information that is gleaned through powers that are available for criminal investigations, even though the criminal investigation in its own right may be based on a very thin allegation, uh, which. Like Niven said, we all know from the offset it's not going to go anywhere when it gets to Crown. It still gives the ability for the police service to use powers that aren't available to any other employer to put together a case for misconduct. Now, that's not proportional. Uh, it's also not fair. Uh, and in particular, some of the issues that feature there would relate to the regulation of investi investigative powers, RIPSA um, uh, provisions in Scotland for intrusive surveillance and the likes. Uh, so the issue of proportionality is, uh, is key in all of this. Uh, fairness, uh, I, mean if, uh, I don't want to sound like a, like a corporate statement, but fairness, integrity and respect would be uh, a good starting point in all of this. And I'm not saying that the individuals that are involved in the investigation don't do their job professionally. Of course they do. Uh, they wouldn't be in these departments otherwise, but proportionality has got to be the key. So it's not all the Crown's fault? Not always. Now, what's the, what should we be looking at then to, to resolve this, or to, that you should be looking at to resolve it? I think there's two issues here. I, again, a um, comment has been made around the Crown. Um, when you look at this, the figures um, and you highlight that cases of two years, etc., have been with the Crown, that yeah. is a requirement for Crown to uh, consider whether there's procedural issues to be addressed in relation to how they deal with criminal complaints about police officers. Um, so that, that is a major issue uh, that has to be addressed. And the second point that's been touched on is misconduct investigations and the element of proportionality. We do have a locus in misconduct investigations. We have the ownership in terms of that timescale to count that misconduct investigation. Misconduct investigations cannot be undertaken until the completion of the criminal process. Mm -hmm. Um, and <clears throat> if there is a further inference of criminality when the misconduct investigation has been carried out, again, we have to go back to the Crown and highlight that because we have no other option in this. In terms of the timescale, um, I appreciate there will be e examples that are highlighted about uh, extensive time periods, but we can also highlight examples where there has been quick turnaround. We can highlight examples when people have been reported for criminality and there has been an assessment um, when the case is returned and they have not went to misconduct. So it's, it's unfair to make a general comment to say that um, we then move direct to misconduct because it's not the case. That no, is an I assessment think there's the, the two issues here. Yes. I understand the two issues, but, but a length of time is something that maybe we have to yes. look at. And I don't know if it's within our, it's not within our remit really to call the Crown to account. We can certainly ask it on another occasion. But it's the, it's the 6.7% at yes. the end of that day. There's something going wrong there when it's, you know, you've got all these people, 90 odd percent, no proceedings. Even if there's extra referrals, if you're doing misconduct proceeding and you find something else, you've got to refer it back, which gives you delay in time. The tests appear to be wrong to me to go to the Crown in the first place. Uh, I appreciate what you said about higher 
a higher level of integrity and so on and if you're in this position but it just seems there's something terribly wrong with that level john do you want to come in on that you're looking at me if, if only do. i hadn't been looking dizzy that's what i was going, going to, to ask, ask about, well, was, see, about criminal jump. matters so uh, I, uh, and it what uh, Mr Steele's right, everything is about proportionality and, and it is to understand the, the restraints with which every police officer who receives an allegation of a criminal nature against another officer has to respond. And, uh, can, can I ask about one aspect that seems to be um, potentially growing, and this is not about any specific case, but the issue of data protection. Increasingly we're going to see more use of data, handheld data, devices by operational officers seems to be and it's got gone f for some considerable time that there's quite a, a zealous approach taken to the application of data protection legislation when it comes to police officers now we would all want the highest standards of integrity to apply but yeah, i mean if there's challenges at the moment there's likely to be increasing challenges in the future because of the the growing availability of data and the readily ex how readily accessibility in, out with uh, buildings etc etc can members comment on that, please? I'm feeling this might also be connected to RIPSA, but I'm not sure. Uh, my, my view on the approach for data protection in the police service and the reporting to the Crown Office for Criminality is that the approach is perverse. Now, the police service has got little discretion in this because there is a direction from the Lord Advocate's Office that any uh, inference of any breach of data protection must be reported to the, to the Crown Office. But... I think, I've, I've, if I've not said it here, I've certainly said it in other public arenas. I believe if you were to look at every single police officer in Scotland and look at their data footprint at some point in time, uh, they would have fallen foul of the provisions of the Data Protection Act in some way that would result in them being reported to the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. Police officers, by our very nature, are nosy people. We're encouraged to be nosy. Uh, when we've got uh, new uh, IT systems put before us, intelligence systems or uh, incident recording, we're encouraged to play with them, to pro probe around with them, to find out how they work. Uh, in the past, uh, when b before we became... You're not building so, to a confession here, Mr. Uh, Stilalia, because we're <laughs> very anxious. Uh, in, in the past, before we became so... Before we became so heavily dominant on uh, uh, computers for, for uh, uh, accessing data, we had registries. In fact, I dare say we still have registries in many police stations. We still went and looked. If, we, if you hadn't dealt with a particular kind of incident, you went and looked how somebody else did it before. Undertaking that activity today could, could, could potentially consider to be fallen foul of data protection. The whole approach is just wrong. It shouldn't be about the accessing of data. It should be about the misuse of the data. And there is no indication that there is a wholesale abuse in that regard. Yes, Mr. I, I would like to highlight, and, and it's, again, these investigations take some time, and the people who are under investigation have restrictions placed on them which often prevent them from accessing particular data which restricts the job they do. So from a managerial point of view, we have officers who may be particularly able, who we can't utilise in their specialism eh, because of the restriction that's been placed on them for a case in ultimately they'll probably be exonerated in any event. So, so it's wider than just the prosecution, it's implications for the service delivered to the public as well. I was going to bring Alison in, but just before you do it, of that, of the figures that were referred to, of these uh, 225 referrals to the Crown Office, you any idea how many of these were to do with data protection, alleged data protection breaches? I mean, are we looking, is that, is that something that's substantive in this, or a red herring? Um, I don't have those figures, unfortunately. However, what I can say is, uh, from the number of restricted officers that we have in Police Scotland just now, a third of officers are on restriction as a result of reports of data protection breaches. You could, however, provide us with a breakdown of the 225... Well, yes, yes you can. I don't think that would be sub judice because they're, they're just... It's what they're being reported for. So if we could have that information... Yes, in I particular, could. a breakdown of the section. So if it's data protection forming the whole or part of it, we would like to know. John? Can I pose two very quick questions, please, to... Yeah, well, I, I was going to let Alison, because it seemed to have opened up an issue well, here, that, that let Alison... John, one question, then Alison okay. a question, then your other question. But so it, there it was you a question to Mr Ross, which is closely linked and, and indeed ties in with it, your previous referral to your role when you chaired it. And it's the issue of vexatious complainers. Is that something ultimately that will be following up? 
the potential. I know we're early in the, the stages. And the second part of that, if I may... That's sneaky, but on you go. On you it, go. it was the questions. counterbalance to that, Mr <laughs> Ross, and that is that oh, in, 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 a, in a previous life, you rightly promoted the level of letters of appreciation from the public that came in. And if someone's gone out of the way to do that, so whilst we're talking a lot of negative terms, there's a lot of people who speak very highly. And is that something that could be published I want to, as well? I want to leave part of that just now because I want to go back to what we were dealing with. I think it was to do with the point I started with, isn't it? It's about um, access to information. Yes. Um, unauthorised access Sorry. to information, to databases, is in itself um, a misuse. And, and, and I'm slightly concerned with um, Mr Steele's um, approach. It's precisely because uh, people are nosy people that there are restri restrictions in place to stop unauthorised access to data. So I'd like, uh, is this not surely a training issue um, that needs to be greatly, uh, much more greatly understood within the police service? Yeah, thank you. Can, can, I, can I perhaps give an example which I think will probably uh, uh, explain what, uh, or certainly uh, uh, contextualised largely what uh, what I was referring to. I, uh, in a past life, was very fortunate to have served in the uh, in the very beautiful Isle of Harris. Uh, now, uh, thankfully, the the Hebridean people, uh, as I am known uh, to uh, have a great affection and affinity for, are largely law-abiding individuals, and not much happens in the way of criminality. But that being said, I spent five and a half years in Inverness before I went to, uh, to Tarbert and Harris, and I had a great deal of knowledge about the activities of criminals in and around the Inverness area. Uh, so whilst I may have had responsibility for a policing beat in and around uh, the Hebrides, uh, I had much to offer uh, my colleagues in uh, Inverness by being able to look at the incidents that were taking place there. Now, it may well have been that on an ongoing daily basis, uh, depending on what was taking place, that I had nothing to offer because the incidents did not spark a, 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 um, a, a light in my mind as to who may or may not have been responsible. But that didn't mean that the potential for uh, having benefit to those uh, that I had left behind didn't exist, and the same happened in reverse when I left Harris. I went, went to uh, uh, went to police in the uh, in the in the, in the Highlands again in, in Dingwall. So there are always opportunities for police officers to be nosy. There is nothing wrong with being nosy. There is nothing wrong with looking to find out what's taking place in terms of the activities of individuals that you may or may not have had uh, responsibility for. Where there is problem, and this is where criminal misuse comes in, is a genuine criminal misuse in terms of the information being passed thereafter, so when nominal records have got nothing at all to do with uh, policing activity uh, is, is engaged in. But many members fall foul of looking at incidents that someone says, that's got nothing to do with your beat, it's got nothing to do with your area, and therefore you shouldn't have been looking, and that is the wrong test. I wonder if Mr Ross has anything to say to Well, me. does anybody else want to comment, uh, Mr uh, Ross? It, it, on the specifics of the, the issue of data or, or Mr Finney's question, I'm happy to try and respond to both, if you wish. Both, please. Okay, well, um, firstly on Mr Finney's question, um, I, I, we don't use and we don't recognise the title vexatious. I think that has a whole range of other implications. It's about unacceptable actions and behaviour. And as I said uh, at an earlier stage today, that, that, that is probably more about the, the manner of their interaction and the way in which they conduct themselves, particularly with, with other people and particularly our staff. But the critical factor is that if they do make representations uh, which involve a complaint, then we will still assess that complaint. What you sometimes find, though, it's a complaint that's already been dealt with, it's been finalised, and you've got uh, people recycling a complaint in a way which um, has uh, and some unf unfortunate uh, manner and some, and some unfortunate language that you use with people. And that's when we would begin to initiate that. But we'd, it's rarely done, but it has been done. Um, on, on the issue of, um, of data, I can confirm that certainly in terms of our scrutiny, particularly in private sessions of the Complaints Committee, that, that we look at reasons and we look at, in fact, in, in great detail, and it's a standing item, uh, uh, officers that are suspended and also officers that are restricted duties. Uh, we do touch on it in the public session, but the reason we take it in private is that it allows a much more detailed and open discussion. And that is discussed at every complaints committee meeting. And I can also confirm that specifically on the issue of data management, that has been raised and it's been raised with um, chief officers who are present at the complaints committee meeting. And one of the things that we actually raised was the basis on which such decisions were made and to ensure that there was a consistency of approach. And in fact, the, the, um, the designated um, DCC 
Deputy Chief Constable, in fact, has reported to us orally on that particular point and did give a satisfactory response. I just, if I, might, just, I just, just wondered if Chief Superintendent, you looked as if you wanted to come in, no, but you no, didn't. No, no, I was just listening intently. Don't give me those looks or you get your... <laughs> yes. yes, 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 Superintendent. Simply to, to reiterate a small point, um, the, um, the legislation is clear um, and the Lord Advocate's guidance is clear. Um, again, it's not the disclosure of personal information, it's the obtaining of personal information. Uh, and again, we go back to the conversation we had earlier on, inference of criminality, no discretion in terms of our approach. And Mr Ross has highlighted the term consistency. To achieve a consistency of approach, we have got no option other than to report to Crown. And just touching on this sort of view that there are wholesale issues of data protection issues within Police Scotland, when you look at the number of restricted officers for data protection in comparison to the number of officers in Police Scotland, we are talking about a very small number, but there are lessons to be learned. There are additional training opportunities. The reiteration of the standards that exist, it's clear that that does exist, and we have to continue to work with that. But it's that inference of criminality and the lack of discretion that we have with that. Yeah, I'm just thinking, um, because I think it would be useful for the committee is to write to the Crown and just let them take note of the evidence that we've had from you and ask them if they wish to comment. We wouldn't necessarily need to call them here, but if there's something wrong at the Crown process end as well, I'm not saying there is, then you know, it gives the Crown the, opposite, or the, or the um, opportunity to return to it. John, did you have another question? Just if, if, if Mr Ross, uh, uh, the issue of letters of appreciation, uh, oh, yes. that, that aspect there, if there was any way of promoting the overwhelming good practice that takes place. You know, we talk, we're, talk, we're at a committee talking about this because it is such a small and unrepresented. Mm -hmm. right. Well, c can I just echo the point that a number of people have made? I think we sh and that is that uh, in terms of the performance, the conduct and the commitment of police officers and Police Scotland, it's overwhelmingly one that has the best interests of the people of Scotland. And that's, uh, you know, that's my consistent and absolute experience. And I think you raise a very good point. I think we, we tend to get somewhat focused on the, the complaint side of the business, quite rightly so. It's important and it must be handled well. And there is an expectation in terms of behaviour and conduct from police officers, and it's a very high one. But I think... As a consequence of that, and perhaps it's something that's been slightly lost in the transition, and I know you, what you're talking about in terms of in the Northern Constabulary and the, and the Joint Northern mm -hmm. Police Board, there was that opportunity to highlight that. And I'm very happy to actually to take that away from, from here today, and I will raise it with the board. What I would say within the board itself, there are a number of occasions when, when we have raised and congratulated and uh, applauded Police Scotland and officers for things that they have done, but it's not a formal process as such. But I just want to put that recognition on the record today. Okay, thank you very much. Sometimes even MSPs get thank you cards. They're so rare, you keep them framed. Um, can I say thank you very much? And I'm looking forward to more details of this business of the criminal, criminal proceedings and only the 6.7% leading to proceedings being taken in particular, the, the number that are data protection or data protection connected in some manner. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now move into private session as we agree.